Hey guys, what's up? I'm Sai High, and in this week's Deck Tech, I'm going to keep it real and down to earth and talk about one of the best, if not the best, performing decks in best of one for not only Historic, but also Explorer. Now, unlike some YouTubers, uh, I know it's fun to try janky, weird, untested ideas and brewy decks. Um, no doubt that's fun, and sometimes people will get lucky go on a 7-0 uh, trip in an event and make some unfounded, ridiculous claims about some new strategy and 100% win rate. And yeah, that can be fun, but it's also kind of BS. So if you appreciate a real look at an awesome deck that you can use to farm and collect more packs, play points, gems, coins, you name it, definitely like and subscribe, follow me, uh, and we'll take a look at all competitive things here. So without further ado, we're talking, of course, red deck wins, red aggro, mono red aggro, whatever you want to call it. This has been one of the most polished decks in best of one historic and now explorer. Um, we look across the social media universe, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere, wherever, Reddit. We see countless posts of these red deck wins uh, type decks, and they're almost all they're all very similar. The deck has gotten really tight at this point. Um, the 60 cards is pretty locked down. The mana base is pretty locked down. There's definitely a few tweaks here and there where you can uh, make subtle changes, and we'll talk about those. But the deck has gotten really polished, and uh, you can really use this deck right now to uh, farm the events and get a lot of gems and play points. Um, it's an exciting time because, because uh, Explorer is still so new, um, I find that there's still a lot of people brewing a lot of different decks and exploring strategies, uh, no doubt, because it's very fun. And I, I've been doing the same thing. Um, I've been trying uh, lots of different decks and doing these you know, best of one events where you have to get seven wins uh, to get the play point. And with lots of unfounded, goofy, different brews, um, yeah, I've gotten you know five, six, four, five, six wins. But it wasn't until I finally just accepted the hard truth that this red deck wins is legit. It's super polished. It's super powerful. It's really uh, got an incredible win rate on the play. It can be unbeatable in certain matchups um, when you're on the play. And so I switched to this in the in the last like five or six um, explorer events. So far, I've gotten uh, six or seven wins every time. Um, and so that's great. Um, you can just keep farming and collecting, um, you know, in-game currency um, so long as this deck stays on top of the meta. Um, now, one thing before we delve in, I just want to say about Untapped. Um, you know, I said that this is one of the best decks, if not the best decks. Untapped data certainly objectively suggests this as well. Um, but untapped data isn't perfect. Um, you know, it's only collecting data on people that are running the untapped client. The only people that really truly have the best data, of course, would be Wizards of the Coast and access to all game logs. Uh, that being said, untapped data is still very useful and it objectively backs up that this is uh, at least one of the best decks. I believe they're, they're showing uh, Esper vehicles as slightly better than Red Deck wins, but they have these two decks on top. And I totally agree with that. Um, you know, it's very rare that someone's running. Um, it's possible, but somebody could could be running a totally off meta meta deck, not running untapped, and they're just cleaning up events and have an incredible win rate. And they're just flying under the radar because the deck has not been reported. But it's pretty unlikely in this day and age. You know, data travels so fast. Um, you know, everyone's sharing um, successful lists all across the internet, social media. So. Again, this is pretty polished, so we can dive right in. Um, so Red Deck wins. Well, before Explorer, of course, was a historic deck. And the only thing we really lose uh, when we port this over to Explorer is in the one drop slot. Uh, the historic version would run Reckless, four copies of Reckless Ringleader, which is, of course, the 1-1 one, one haste goblin that, when it enters the battlefield, uh, perpetually gives one of the creatures in your hand haste. Uh, which is no doubt really powerful, and it's also a rogue, so it uh, synergizes with um, Robber of the Rich. Um, so we lose that um, going to Explorer. However, we really don't lose much because I've replaced it with Fervent Champion. 
Sometimes you see people running the 2-1 Vampire for one red as well. Um, I tend to think Fervent Champion is fine, if not even a little bit underrated. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to do necessarily as busted things as a Reckless Ringleader would, like, um, you know, giving Annex haste is an, an extremely powerful move. So it's not going to do that, but Fervent Champion is a 1-1 first strike haster itself. Um, very aggressive, one drop. The first strike is definitely relevant in the format in that you can mow down a lot of other opposing 1-1s. One um, you know, you've got the the 1-1 one one that leaves behind treasure tokens. Um, I guess potentially that creature could kill your Fervent Champion by when it dies, making this one minus one minus one. But anyways, other, other things you're going to encounter, um, like in Esper or uh, the Mardu Vehicles deck, um, you know, the creature that's... 1-1 one, one for one black, putting three cards in the graveyard. It's just important to have first strike, so you know, you're not trading with other 1-1s. One, At least you can mow them down. But moreover, Fervent Champion can get pretty insane and has good synergy with this deck. The other text on the card is, of course, whenever Fervent Champion attacks, another target attacking knight you control gets plus one, plus zero. So unfortunately, there are no other knights in my list. However, it will trigger uh, with other Fervent Champions. So oftentimes, you get some ridiculous turn twos where maybe you have two of these, and you're basically just plopping down uh, two, two, one, first strike haste creatures, um, and it just gets even more insane the more Fervent Champions you happen to draw. Um, also, the equip ability um, that you activate, um, the target Fervent Champion costs three less to activate. That's actually totally relevant here as well. That just means our Ember Cleaves are free, 100% free to equip, equip to uh, Fervent Champion. So, very good one drop as well. Um, but the all star one drop slot, of course, goes to Kumano Faces Kakazan, or however the hell you pronounce this. Um, apologies for the pronunciation gaffes. But anyways, we all know this card by now. This was an incredible pickup for Red Deck Wins. Um, one of the best possible things you can do for one mana, honestly. Uh, this saga just does so much for one red. Uh, immediately, we're dealing one damage to the opponent and any Planeswalker they control. That is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, being able to deal direct damage from an enchantment, just another source, another vector of attack, is totally relevant. Um, direct damage is huge against control decks, especially um, once you, the, the game gets ground down to a halt. But that one damage to Planeswalkers, I am pleasantly surprised at how much work this actually does. Sometimes it's easy to forget that it even does this, and you just be pleasantly surprised um, when you see a Wandering Emperor getting taken down by this, or a Narset, or a lot of Planeswalkers that you might do a little bit of damage to, or they tick down their loyalty naturally, and they're just left with one loyalty, and you can just get a free kill um, with this card. It's absolutely incredible. Generally, um, depending on my hand, well, usually look to prioritize playing this first rather than a fervent champion, um, especially when you can get the second clause to trigger. So, of course, the second chapter is when you cast your next creature's spell this turn, that creature enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. Also very huge and relevant. So I generally try to prioritize playing this on turn one so you can get that value when you play your creature on turn two. And then lastly... Um, when this transforms into Etchings of Kumano, 2-2 two, two Haste, um, very, very good. But that other sentence, if a creature dealt damage this turn by a source you controlled would die, exile it instead. That is incredibly uh, relevant. And sometimes people often wonder, uh, myself included originally, like why, why it was worded like that, why it says if a creature dealt damage this turn by a source you control would die, exile it instead. And of course the reasoning for that is because if it didn't say this turn, um, then you might have to, you would actually have to like keep track of what um, effects you had dealt damage to creatures on other turns and past turns. So that that reason, it's it's that's why it's worded that way, just to clean up any confusion. So it's absolutely clear um, when the creatures are exiled. But anyways, um, that is hugely relevant, um, especially if you can deal damage to like a cat. Um, before they have an oven or something to sacrifice it. Um, being able to exile things is huge. It does work in the mirror as well. 
um, where you can exile something like Annex instead of killing it, which of course would be hugely relevant so they don't get the 1-1 one, one Red Satter tokens being created upon Annex's death. So Kumano faces Kakazan is just, just an incredible saga, ultra-aggressive card. Again, one of the best things you can do for one mana. So we've got these eight one-drops that are all very strong. Now moving on to the important two-drop slot, which is the most densely populated slot in the deck. Um, almost all of these lists, these successful lists, you see them running a stock two copies of Kari Zev Skyship Raider. Now this creature does a lot of work as well. 1-3 First Strike Menace. Again, the First Strike is very relevant. The Menace is very relevant for making it more difficult for your opponent to block everything. Um, just making combat more of a nightmare for them. But the creation of the 2-1 Red Raghavan Monkey. Huge synergy and relevance in this deck. Um, for at least two things. Uh, <clears throat> we do run Torbran, Thane of Red Fell. So... Making an extra red source to deal damage is totally relevant to just to get that additional plus two damage effect. Also, just creating another attacker is hugely relevant because with our Ember Cleave, we're checking the number of attackers we have, and Ember Cleave's cost is reduced by one for each attacker. So Karizev uh, has synergy with Torbran and Ember Cleave, and even besides that, it's just an all around good two drop aggressive, uh, <coughs> excuse me, aggressive creature. Moving on to kind of a flex slot, um, not always seen in these stock lists, but I've got two copies of Lightning Strike. Just three damage directly at instant speed is always strong, direct damage at instant speed. We don't have Lightning Bolt, of course, in Explorer, but we have Lightning Strike is more or less the best thing for just a, um, you know, uh, direct three damage without any strings attached other than it just costs two mana. But this is uh, huge for clearing the board, uh, making sure we have a larger board state, killing opposing creatures, huge against Grease Fang to be able to kill Grease Fang at instant speed so they can't reanimate their uh, Parahelion or other big dangerous vehicles. Um, in addition to killing and clearing out threats, Planeswalkers, etc., just three damage directly to the face or the dome or uh, target player is absolutely relevant. Um, especially against control as well. Maybe you don't have any good targets, but just three damage to them on end step just to further chip away at their life total and get the win. So Lightning Strike, kind of a flex spot, just running two copies at this point. Now we get to not a flex spot and a common card you'll see in all these lists, four copies of Robber of the Rich. Huge, awesome, aggressive two drop from Throne of Eldraine. Robber of the Rich, two mana, reach, haste. Uh... Don't forget this does have reach. Can be relevant sometimes when you need to block flyers. Doesn't come up very often, but it's easy to forget, um, both when you're playing this deck and against it. Sometimes it just be very easy to forget that they actually have a creature that can block a flyer, because nothing else flies in the deck, but they do have this reach creature. But, of course, that's not the reason we're running this. We're running it because it has haste. It's 2-2, two -two, uh, fast, aggressive beater, 2-2 two -two haste. But, of course, the last ability, whenever it attacks, if you have less cards in your hand, than the opponent. You get to exile top card of their library, and any turn you attacked with a rogue, um, that doesn't even need to be the this rogue, it could be another robber of the rich as well, can trigger this. But then you can cast those cards and you can spend mana as though it were any color to do so. So robber of the rich is huge. It's especially devastating in the mirror uh, when most of the things you're flipping are cards that you're also running and work for you. But it can create some really interesting variants and actual fun with this deck. You can get it in a lot of weird states, even running this same deck, just grinding this all day. Just because this card is so interesting, it can open up avenues for really strange things. Uh, generally, you want to prioritize taking your opponent's stuff if it's going to help you to victory. Um, you know, most sometimes, you know, don't try to get cute and just take something just for the sake of demoralizing them and taking it. It's hopefully something that's actually improving your board and synergizes and works with your deck. But by all means, take creatures, um, take you know anything you can that's going to advance your board state and lead you to victory. But Robber of the Rich is absolutely huge. Just a devastating card once it starts flipping things and you get value off of it. Moving on to what almost looks kind of like innocuous, but Burning Tree Emissary is just truly an all-star in this deck. Um, you know, it's 
it's, I mean, it's not that flashy. You know, it's just a 2-2 two, two creature, but the clause of adding the mana when it enters the battlefield can lead to some ridiculous things. Um, you know, Needless to say, if you have multiple Burning Tree Emissaries in hand, you can just have busted turn twos where you just you know put two or three of these in play. If your opponent doesn't have a sweeper, they're almost surely dead. They can't. This is too much pressure too early. But moreover, the additional two mana, even if you don't have another Burning Tree Emissary, like I said earlier, the two drop is the most densely uh, populated area of the deck in terms of the casting cost ratios. So most likely, ideally, you're going to be playing this and dropping another two drop creature. Or at worst case scenario, um, well, I guess worst case scenario, you, you have nothing. But, uh, you know, secondary, not as good scenario. You're just dropping another, uh, you're, you're not driving a creature, but maybe you're lightning striking them or a creature. Or you have a bone crusher giant and you can just stomp their face for just an additional two damage. Stomp something in play. Um, it's really quite amazing just how much that extra mana early helps. It just can just lead to busted starts, especially on the play that are just, your opponent just can't keep up with them unless their deck is, you know, designed to do so and heavily positioned to survive such a onslaught of an aggro deck such as this. But Burning Tree Emissary is just an auto four inclusion. It's so powerful um, in different formats. This was banned at, at some point. So this is an absolute uh, huge card in this deck. Um, Moving on to the last two drop I have, not stock in these lists by any means, but the stock of, uh, for lack of better words, of this card is rising. Uh, people have quickly identified that this is a really unique magic card, unlicensed hearse. Um, so at its core, you know, this is graveyard uh, control and removal, but it's unique in that it's also a threat. You know, a lot of times we see graveyard cards like Rest in Peace, which is like the all-star bomb of just clearing out graveyards, but they don't do anything else. Or maybe it's, you know, a relic, um, which isn't legal in Explorer, but is um, definitely legal in Historic. Or you have a lantern, some sort of artifact that deals with graveyards. And sometimes their secondary ability oftentimes is just like drawing an extra card, which is fine. And that's good because then you can at least use get some value out of the card even when your opponent isn't utilizing their graveyard in any way um, but it does waste time just to cycle and draw cards but this is where I really like this unlicensed hearse and I think it actually has a place in this red deck wins win deck I'm not quite sure on the amount right now that's gonna be determined by the number of other graveyard decks at large uh, and again we mentioned Grease Fang Vehicles is the premier graveyard deck right now in Explorer and Unlicensed Hearse is great against it. So for two mana, we're getting a vehicle. We get to exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard per turn. Generally speaking, we want to do this in a reactionary way, uh, meaning we, we don't want to just blindly clip two cards. We want to wait um, and see and use this on our opponent's end step. Unless we have significant reason not to wait, like they've got a card with flashback that we're worried they're going to play. Um, you can't, in response, try to remove it after they've played it. It doesn't work that way. So keep in mind just those nuances. Um, but generally speaking, you'll want to do this in a reactionary way, especially against Grease Fang. Um, you'll just want to wait and see if they actually have the combo. Wait for them to ditch the, uh, the powerful vehicles in their graveyard. Um, of course, if it's end step, go ahead and pluck them, get them out of there. But otherwise, wait for Grease Fang to hit play. And this is especially true if they have multiple vehicles in the graveyard. Wait for Grease Fang to actually target the vehicle. In Arena, it'll show you which one is being targeted. And in response, you just exile the vehicle that they're trying to return. Um, but So, unless it's Hearst, like I said, it's awesome graveyard removal. But then we also get a threat on top of that. As you start to remove graveyards... And even if your opponent isn't using their graveyard, but maybe they cycle through a lot of spells, they're control, they're killing your things, they're casting spells, cantripping, whatever, you can remove your own things from the graveyard because we don't care about our graveyard. You can also continuously remove your opponent's stuff. And as you're doing that, the unlicensed hearse just gets larger and larger. And eventually, you can crew this thing. Um, I think I've, I've crewed up to a 10-10 at this point. 
Um, surprised I haven't gotten higher yet, but you can end games quickly. Also of note, what's so good about this, it's a, um, another vector of attack. What I love about this deck so much is it's got built-in resiliency to sweepers. For instance, Unlicensed Hearse can't die to a sorcery speed sweeper, assuming it's not crude, of course. So this means your opponent does some sort of Wrath of God effect. They clear your board. You have no creatures left. But now that means even if you, on the following turn, you cast something that doesn't even have haste, like a Burning Tree Emissary, which is generally kind of a weaker card later in the game because the mana isn't as relevant and sometimes it's you know it's just a boring 2-2 grizzly bear but this will synergize great with a built up you know jacked up unlicensed hearse so say they sweep the board you got this up to like maybe it's eaten six eight cards you drop this you crew it and it's functionally like attacking with a large haste creature after a board wipe um, because you get to cr the you know the creature you're dropping gets to crew this immediately and attack uh, with the hearse. So really unique card. Um, I've debated. I'm I'm only on one right now, and I, by all means, I, I you know I understand you can't just shove one of these and, and think it's going to make that much of a difference in your grease fang matchups. But it absolutely does make some difference because the games where you do draw this against a graveyard type deck. Um, your win percentage just simply is going to go up. It's 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 just as simple as that. Like having this and denying and shutting off their combo, even if it's temporary, is huge. But at um, best case scenario, it completely shuts off their combo all game, and they they can't find an answer to this. So having one copy, I'm very comfortable running one copy. Um, it's not a legend, but it does have diminishing returns, I believe, a little bit from having multiples of these because. You know, there's only so much stuff you can eat out of the graveyards, and it's hard to, you know, get two of these guys, two of these vehicles pumping up that hard. So I'm on one, just the one copy right now. I could potentially see bumping up to two. It's very difficult to know what to take out, though, because like I said, this deck is so polished at this point, and all these cards are extremely critical and strong and functional for the deck. Um, you know, Lightning Strike could argue cutting one of those for one more additional hearse. But Lightning Strike also has universal application against almost every deck you can play, where the hearse, you know, kind of does because, like I said, it can be a threat even if they don't uh, use their graveyard directly. But Lightning Strike also against Grease Fang, which is maybe um, the other best deck in the format. Of course, Lightning Strike is, is good against Grease Fang, and you can deny the combo as well by killing Grease Fang at instant speed. But anyways, let me know in the comments. Um, about this deck like what what do you think the optimal numbers are what do you think of my numbers are i'd love to hear it love to debate things and try to push this to be as competitive as possible um and i'll go through the rest of the cards and i'll wrap up with some additional thoughts about matchups and how you would tweak this to shore up some of the worst matchups but quickly let's just run through the rest of the cards of course in the three drops we've got four annex hard in the forge just an awesome bomb power is equal to devotion to red so the power is going to be huge um the claws of whenever it dies or another non-token creature you, can, you control dies. Getting all these 1-1 satters is huge. Um, after a board wipe, um, you have resiliency to board wipes with this. You can still finish them off and kill them with satters. Uh, also, one of the best, oh, uh, is the best target, generally speaking, for Embercleave in the deck. Um, it gets absolutely huge power. Having a double strike trampler with huge power is just a nightmare. It's almost impossible to block. Unless you have a ton of fatties on the board, you're just dead. Absolutely dead to Annex combined with Embercleave. So Annex, four copies, just incredible card. Even when you draw multiples, it's not the worst thing. Sometimes you can chain two of these and get four Satter tokens, even if you have to play one and sack it due to the legend rule. Um, there'll be a 4-3, and you sack it so you'll get... Um, each each one will trigger and you'll get like four Satter tokens or something like that. So very good card. Moving on, Bone Crusher Giant, another awesome card from Throne of Eldraine. Stomp ability. I'd be absolutely surprised by still how many people don't understand what you can do with Stomp. In addition to just dealing two damage to any target, has a very, very important line of text on it. Damage can't be prevented this turn. This is your out to anything... Um, that's preventing damage and has you in kind of a prison lock, you know, whether it's, again, the Solemnity 9 lives combo, 
or um, they've got a ruined halo out, um, the white enchantment that gives you protection from uh, a card. So maybe you've got, um, you know, maybe you've got a couple of robber of the riches or something, and they 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 say they cast ruined halo and they give themselves protection from this creature. You can literally just bone crush giant them. Now damage can't be prevented this turn. People often still forget also that that negates protection effects. Um, cause when something, ha if, whether it's a player or a creature, um, then they have protection from, um, you know, another creature, it's preventing that damage. But when you cast this, it no longer, no longer can do that. So this is a huge card. Even, even not when you're not doing tricky things like that, like where that's relevant, it's just an awesome card besides this point, getting to stomp something, having, um, direct damage to creatures, planeswalkers or players is excellent but then you still get the value of a 4-3 body that also has um, kind of built-in protection in itself that when they target the Bone Crusher Giant, they take two damage. So just a spectacular magic card, four full copies. I would not run any less, personally. It, it's that good. This card is huge. It's especially good in the mirror um, if you happen to be on the draw in a unique situation where you're going to actually have card advantage on your opponent. And sometimes it's best to have these direct damage spells where you just keep clearing their board, kill all their creatures, and follow it up with 4-3 giants. Um, it can actually win in a mirror match when you're on the play. It's a great card to have um, in the mirror match, just even, even when you're on the play as well. But just an awesome card. Moving on, now we get to the, the higher drop area. In We often see decks running either Ember Cleave, Torbran or both and I've accepted that both are extremely strong and each one can be stronger in different situations they are both still legendary so I'm running three of each but we just cover get Ember Cleave out of the way uh, this is this just this flash equipment ends so many games like I said most of the time if you if you have if you can cast this you know you attack with three creatures and it costs three you attack with four creatures it only costs two red um, you can wait to see how your opponent blocks then you can cast this target an unblocked creature often killing your opponent maybe board states more important and you don't have the ability to kill your opponent yet with the damage on board but then you can just uh, slap this on one of the creatures they blocked Killing their creature, likely mowing more damage through with the trample. Uh, this just makes blocking a nightmare and just impossible for the opponent. Um, like I said, if, if they don't have a way to kill the creature that you're attempting to attach it to, oftentimes this is just absolutely lights out. But similarly, Torbrand is also incredibly strong in this deck. Um, when you get multiple red sources, especially, um, also the three red and the cost... Being that we're mono red, that's no problem at all. We can cast it super easily, but getting a lot of small red creatures on the board and then casting this is just a knockout punch as well. Also makes blocking so difficult for your opponent. Um, but that three red adds to the devotion to Annex, so it synergizes there. And again, I already talked about some of the things that make extra creatures like Kari Zev, um, as well as the Satyrs. They're also red, so they're picking up this uh, buff from Torbrand. In addition to one of the best land creature lands we've had in a long time in Den of the Bugbear, not only is the creature that you animate this a red goblin creature, but it makes another red goblin creature when it attacks, and they're all going to receive the buffs from Torbrand. So it's incredible. Again, these are legends, though. So I've, I've gone three apiece. I think it may be a little excessive to go four each. Um, you can get hands that are just too much of this top end game finishing stuff when you really want to curve out nicely in this deck. You know, some of the best possible things you could do be turn one Kumano into multiple burning tree emissaries or a burning tree emissary, another creature curved right into annex, followed by an ember cleave or a Torbrand on the following turn. And that's often a four turn four kill easily right there. So the deck's, again, super polished, super strong. Now we can quickly talk about the lands. We mentioned Den of the Bugbear, one of the best creature-based lands we've had in a while. Also for Ramanap Ruins, um, the cost is very negligent. The pain when life to add a red. 
It's not super relevant in you know ninety nine percent of the matches, unless you just get screwed and like it's your only Lana sources and you're dealing a lot of damage to yourself. But hopefully that's not happening. Um, I like Ramanap Ruins a lot more than Castle Embreth, which can also be really good to uh, Castle Embreth, of course can uh, make all your creatures plus one plus zero. Um, also very good. However, um, it does have the slight possibility of coming into play tapped if you don't have another mountain where this does not. As well as Castle Embreath, of course, is useless and it depends on other creatures to be good. Now, it can be really, really good um, after a board wipe to buff all your satyrs. But I believe Ramanap Ruins is just the better card than uh, Castle Embreath because, again, it doesn't require creatures to deal damage. Whereas Ramanap Ruins, um, you know, you can do this on their upkeep. Um, two damage to each opponent. doesn't even target them. So they can't get around it with like a Ley Line of Sanctity or something stupid like that. It's just the better uh, card for aggressive damage pushing. And then finally, to wrap up, um, we've got one copy of Sekenzin Crucible of Defiance. Uh, just, a, again, another awesome new card from Kamigawa, uh, one of the legendary land cycles. Uh, we, we're just creating two 1-1 one, one colorless spirits. Um, very good. No cost to run one of these. Comes into play untapped. Uh, notably, there are a lot of legendary creatures in this deck, so um, it can be easy to miss sometimes that you can actually play this for three rather than four maybe you've got a Kari Zev in play or an Annex or a Torbren and this is just two more creatures with haste that you can throw onto the board and also can't even be countered by traditional counter spell effects because it's an activated ability um, so another just awesome land so the mana base is really, really tight. You pretty much in all, a lot of these lists, you see just four ruins, four dens, and one Sekenzin floating around in there. And sometimes people might, you know, uh, shove in one Castle Embrith or whatever. But I just think the ruins is slightly better um, for the reasons I stated earlier. Uh, now, let's talk about the land count real quick. I'm actually on 25, I believe, instead of 24, which you most often see 24, at least in the lists I've seen. Quick note about that. 25 to me, well, it's a subtle difference. I don't believe it's it's too many. It has not felt like it in a lot of sample games I've run so far. The reason being is that um, Ramen Up Ruins and Den are really powerful effects. Again, it's another vector of attack, especially against control. They're not hitting this with sweepers. So getting up to five lands, I think, is important for this deck. Um, it's totally good and fine. Obviously, you don't want to completely flood, but getting to a five lands is, is totally fine because you're often going to have ruins deal additional damage to your opponent. Remember, you have to sacrifice this. So there's a little bit of a cost to lose the land, um, especially when you're looking to fuel and potentially activate more Ramanap ruins. Maybe you are looking to activate a Den of the Bugbears. You want that five lands. So I've, I felt 25 is absolutely fine in this deck, especially when you have some higher end things that are very important for the deck to resolve. Um, but just Den of the Bugbear is so strong that I'm happy to get to five lands and activate this. Um, now, you know, 24 lands is perfectly fine too. And maybe you just run an additional lightning strike. Maybe you're just running, seeing a lot of graveyard uh, stuff add another hearse or maybe some other totally different card um again let me know in the comments um what you think of this list exactly and maybe you're on a similar list what's working for you now that being said that's the deck let's talk about the matchups like i believe in best of one this there's very few poor matchups almost all the matchups are good and winnable and favorable um the grease fang deck feels kind of like a toss-up you know going on the play is hugely important if you do have your hearse i think you're slightly favored provided they don't find an answer quickly for it but sometimes if you're on the play even if you don't have a hearse you can blow them out um sooner than they can get their combo online and you can finish them off but that that matchup feels kind of 50 50 ish uh, to me, but almost everything else feels favored, especially these uh, a lot of the control decks, some of these Yorian decks. 
Um, you can just blow these decks out. Um, it's just like child's play. They, they can't hang with an aggro deck like this, at least pre-sideboard, where they're just not configured to deal with the amount of threats coming at them in different ways and different vectors. The one matchup where uh, that would not be favored, in my opinion, would be a heavy gain life deck, like an Angel's deck. Well, it's absolutely beatable, especially on the play, and you can just run them over with Embercleave, especially if you get a, a strong start. You can keep their life total under the threshold where they get the the benefits from some of their creatures that buff all of their guys. Um, however, you don't want to play against an Angel's deck that's just gaining a shit ton of life. Obviously, with a deck like this, um, where you're just trying to reduce their life total to zero as quickly as possible. But that being said, the Angel's decks are they're just not that heavily played right now that I'm willing to you know, bump into them here and there and not necessarily have a great matchup because um, you know, those decks, uh, they're pretty much awful against control. Um, you know, they have Collected Company that can ha help with that a little bit, but these decks aren't that common yet. They got better with Giada for sure. Um, but if the meta does change, <clears throat> and Angels, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> If it gets <clears throat> really, uh, choked out my spit, too excited to talk about the Angels matchup. All right. If Angels gets really uh, strong, we have a million ways we can deal with it, right? Uh, we got anti-life gain effects. We're talking best of one, but uh, in best of three, we could always run anti-life gain effects. If Angels gets really popular, um, you know, we can always start to bring in a little bit more of our anti-life gain effects, whether it's the Vortex or the Creature. Um, you know, we got Roiling Vortex. This is more of like an anti-combo card, really. Um, but um, this, you know, not good in a blind meta, meta anymore, in my opinion, especially in Explorer, um, where there's a little bit less of that crazy combo graveyard stuff compared to Historic. Um but we've got a lot of other tools. So, such as Rampaging and So, like, I'm not running these because in the mirror match, they're just, they're, they're trash. And I think, and against decks that aren't gaining life, it's just very weak. And it's going to actually hurt you in some instances. But all I'm saying is, if, if the Angels deck, if there's some regular, huge shift in the meta, uh... We we have we have answers to that. So the I feel the only bad matchup is really this um, this g excessive gain life. But we can totally shift our deck to deal with that. So that's the deck. Definitely like and subscribe. I'm gonna drink more water so I don't die and choke on my spit. Let me know what you guys think in the comments of this exact list. What do you think of Hearse here? I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, definitely want to know what you guys think. So that's the deck for now. Stay tuned in some next videos. I will take this on a run for some of the uh, Explorer events and see if we can't start farming some more seven win victories and sharing it here. So thanks for watching all the way, guys. I appreciate it. As always, good luck on the ladder and peace.